So, today we continue our journey of adventure with Jesus, and today our title is The Unexpected Places Along the Adventure. Does unexpected ever happen in your life? Or is everything that happens in your life always expected? If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading to start with from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. When we come to know Jesus as our Savior, it takes us to all kinds of places. And for myself, I think of what the adventure has been like for me or what, what my life has been like since I met Jesus. And for myself, I, as I think of adventure, I think of exciting places. I think of places that are not always excited. I think of places that are really safe, and I think of places that are not very safe. But honestly, I don't even know what that really means. Because what we would term as safe is not really safe. And what we term as not safe is really safe. Because what we term as safe is when we think everything is in control. And that's not really safe when it's not in control. And when it's out of our control, we say it's not safe. But when it's out of our control and in God's control, that's when it's really safe. And so a few thousand years ago, a young girl, 13 years old, we talked about it a bit last week, a girl 13 years old, she, she heard a voice from an angel, and the angel said that the Holy Spirit is going to come on her. She was going to conceive and bear a child, and it was going to be a child of God. It was going to be the Messiah. She was engaged to be married to her husband, Joseph. And she said yes. Knowing when she said yes, that her husband could say I don't know you, and I'm going to get rid of you. In fact, we read in the scripture, it says that, that, jo that Joseph had in mind to quietly divorce her because of the pregnancy that was coming. But he didn't, because the, the angel of God talked to him, and the angel said, Joseph, this is going to be the child of God, and you're going to be a father figure to him on earth. And Joseph said, yes. And so today I'm going to be looking at some of the key places along the journey that we had from Luke's gospel and a variety of other places in scripture to help us understand where, does the, where are these unexpected places along the journey and what does it look like? And that first place that we read about in scripture that we read on as we read in Luke chapter 2 is the stable. The stable is one of these unexpected places along the journey. Now, when you stop and think about the story, it's kind of a crazy story. And we always paint the picture of the innkeeper as being a totally horrible heathen person, right? Like, we get this image in our mind, like, there's no room in my hand. Would you please get away from me? And we, we try and push him off, and we see the innkeeper as being a really, really bad person. But let's just stop and think for a few moments about what the stable really was maybe like. And we'll look at both sides of the coin. So, so the one side is, is that in, in early Palestinian culture, a stable was a part of the living quarters. And so you had this house, or a fairly large house, and, and one half was living quarters, one half was stables. And the dividing part was the floor would be raised a bit on the one side. That's where you lived. And, and oftentimes with the stable side, you might have a manger fastened to the wall, or the manger might be on the raised floor. And it might be up, and the animals would, would come up to the raised floor, and they would reach over the little fence that was there, and they would eat eat hay out of the manger or whatever grain that they were eating and so it was it was really not that bad a place and and they lived on this side the animals lived on this side and life went on now I've been in a lot of stables in my life having grown up on a farm and having had horses and been around horses my whole life in fact I think one of my unique experiences of, of being in a stables was when when our kids were younger and they were in 4-H the big thing was is you got to sleep a night at the fair in the barn. 
If you've never done that, you should. It'd be good for you. You, you deserve it. So, so there we were one year. We were in the horse barn. And we were trying to get some sleep at night. I was, I was thankful when my wife came in the morning and I was relieved of my duties and I could go back home and sleep. But, you know, you're in the barn, you're lying there. We did have cots and we're laying in the horse barn and, and it sounds kind of cool at first. They're just kind of munching on their grain and, you know, they chew and it sounds kind of good. But after a while, it gets old and then they kick a stall and, and they smack a stall again and they 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 you know, fart, and they make all kinds of other strange noises, and, and they crap, and it starts to stink, and it's, it's just kind of a, not a nice place to stay. And I, I've been in cow barns before, and they're even worse. Their they're piles of manure are much bigger and much louder, and they splatter, and, and it's a mess. And that's where they were maybe staying, right, in a stable like that. We, we, we think about that, and it's like, man, I don't want to be in one of those places. Well, what about an inn? You know, when we think of an inn, we think of like the Hyatt Regency. We think of like the, the motel up here by the interstate, and we think it's all really nice. But you know, in their day, an inn was more like a room maybe this size or maybe half this size. There's just bulks around the outside. And so, so maybe the innkeeper was actually being very generous. And they, they walk up to the door, and he said, Ah, oh, you're pregnant. Oh, you don't want to stay in my inn because I'm going to put you in a room with, you know, maybe this many people. Can you imagine if you were a pregnant woman and you were about to give birth, being in a room with this many people and saying, I'm going to be over here in the corner just having a baby. Don't mind me, I'm just having a baby over here. How would that feel to you? You'd be like, no way. You'd be, I'm not going to do that. So maybe the innkeeper was actually being a very generous guy saying, look, this really isn't a good place for a pregnant woman that's about to have a baby. So if you go down the road to, to Brad and Vivian's house, they have a stable down there, a house they live in, and, and they'll take care of you. They'll put you in their place, and, and, and there'll be a place to stay now. Now, the house may be a little full, but you'll survive, you know? And so baby Jesus is put in the manger. I'm not really sure what all the setting was, but I know that it wasn't like we're accustomed to. And for me this morning, I, I think of passages of Scripture that help me to understand that you know, maybe we're not always really welcome where we go. So in my mind, when I think of the thing of the stable, quite frankly, I don't think of it as really that exciting. You know, like I'm thinking my wife's pregnant and I'm sleeping in a barn. Are you kidding me? I'm, in my mind, I'm feeling really embarrassed. It's like, what does my wife really think of me? She's, she's ready to give birth and I'm putting her in a barn. It's like, eh, you're one of the heifers. Come on there, old Betsy, come over here, you know? Or, or I'm treating her like a little goat, you know, or a kid, a mother, a goat. You know, come on, nanny, you get in here and you can have your kid. I feel really bad as a, as a husband. I feel, feel bad that my wife has to be in these kind of conditions. It's, a stable is not a place that I really want to be. A stable is a place that when my wife is pregnant, I, I want to stay out of the stable. And yet, Joseph and Mary went there. For me, the stable represents the fact that following God and going where God wants me to be doesn't mean that I'm always at a place that's really welcoming. It doesn't always feel like this place that gives you all kinds of warm fuzzies. In John 10, Jesus is having a conversation with, with some of the leaders of the church, and they want to stone him. And it says, it says this, it says, we're, stoning you. we're not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, have claimed to be God. And, and Jesus goes on to have this conversation with them, but they're, they're saying that, that we're going to stone you, Jesus, because you talk about the faith that you have and the trust that you have in your Father, and, and we're not accepting you. And, and for us as a people to recognize that following Jesus on the adventure is going to take us sometimes places we don't necessarily want to go. And it's okay. In John 15, Jesus reward, warns us like this. He says, If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would have loved you as its own of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember, I'm sorry, if you belong to the world, it would have loved you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed me and my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. So for me today, the stable symbolizes that we go because we're followers of God. 
We may be accepted, we may not be accepted, and it doesn't matter. The call is for us to be faithful, and that stable, as you think of the adventure with Jesus, and you think of the stable, realize that it symbolizes more than just Jesus being born there, and it's this cool little nativity scene. It wasn't seen as a cool little nativity scene along Main Street in Wauseon. It wasn't seen that at all. In fact, it was real life. You didn't want to have a baby in a stable, but they did. And God calls us to go to places we don't always want to go to. The other thing I think about, the next thing I think about, as I think of this journey of adventure with Jesus and the places we may end, I think another place that we may end up that we don't always like to talk about is the cross of Jesus. In fact, for me, I, the, the Christmas Advent season has no meaning without having the cross in front of me. And in Luke chapter 23, we read of the account of the crucifixion. And this is what it says in verse 20, 26 of chapter 23. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And then later in the chapter, verse 34, it says, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he says this. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The cross is not a place that we logically think of as a place of being set free. We think of the cross as a place of pain and suffering. It's easy for me to think of the journey of the cross, and I've I've thought a lot of Jesus walking down the Via Della Rosa and he's carrying his cross. You know what I haven't thought about as much until I was studying for this? What was it like for Joseph of Cyrene? So there he is. This man came in from the countryside and he's standing there watching mob activities. And mob activities are usually not real positive. And, and, and he gets asked to carry the cross of Jesus behind Jesus. Jesus has been beaten near to death. And as he's walking along, he's probably falling behind Jesus, and he sees the blood dripping off of his shoulders and his back from the whippings and the beatings that he had taken. He sees the blood probably coming from the crown of thorns that has been placed on his head, and he's carrying this cross saying, what am I doing? I can assure you his life was never the same. And for all of us, when we think of the true aspect of Advent, you can't think of a birth without the cross. If you do, you're missing it. Because if all it was was a cute little nativity scene, it wouldn't have done anything for us. We would still be lost. It's because of the cross that Christmas has meaning. It's because of the cross that everything has changed. It's changed. Paul, one of the guys who wrote most of the New Testament, for him, the cross was a place of being set free and finally reaching his potential. It's really when we die to ourself and are resurrected again in Christ. So, so Paul says it like this in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, he says, I think... Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength and that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saving that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see... It's when we follow the adventure with Jesus and we end up at the cross, we begin to understand our full potential.
You see, we can never live an Advent life if we don't come to the cross. And there's no reason to come to the cross if there's never a birth. And it's at the cross that the ground is the same level for all of us. God doesn't look down from heaven and say, Ah, yeah, there's Glenn and oh, over there's Jamie and <laughs> oh, Brad, he's over there. I mean, they... no, he looks down and he says, These are my children and the, the ground at the foot of the cross is the same for all of us. And God looks down and says, Have they come to the cross? Did they accept me? Was Advent really something? And you see, we can never go on the adventure with Jesus without coming to the cross. And if we come to the cross, we have to go to the tomb. Because if we stay at the cross, there's no hope. His death was pointless. But as we come to the cross and we leave the cross, we come to the tomb. And in Luke 24, it says this in verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. His resurrection and ascension complete the journey. The advent, the adventure, only begins there. But it has zero to do anything for us if we don't go from that, from that birth, nativity scene, to the cross. And if we stay at the cross, we never feel the freedom. We never get to our full potential because the cross makes us feel the weight of the world on our shoulders and we're not given anything beyond that. But it's as we go to the tomb that we feel that grace and mercy that comes to us and the blood of Christ washes over us and we're set free that we can truly, truly live. You see, it's in the grave, his death, in ourselves that we realize that there's more to life. And it's in his resurrection that we see that we are risen. So my question for all of us here today is, are we alive or are we dead? What's your adventure like? If you haven't went to the cross, if you haven't been to the tomb and see that he is risen, you can't live an Advent life. And the adventure does not work for you. But it's when life comes to us through Jesus Christ, when we've been to the cross and we've accepted his forgiveness and we've been to the grave and we've experienced the fullness of his grace, it's then that we can truly live and we're made alive. Which leads us to the last point I want us to see this morning, and that is this. In Acts chapter 1, he tells his disciples, he says, it, it, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to wait there until this gift that I'm going to give you comes upon you, the Holy Spirit. And when it comes to you, then you're going to know. And then the disciples say this to Jesus. They say, oh, Jesus, is it at that time that we are then going to see the fulfillment of your kingdom on earth? They were still expecting that Jesus was going to come in with a strong arm of the law and take over the world politically. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the time or the hour when I'm going to take over. But you go and wait in Jerusalem. And when, when you wait there, this gift that I have promised you will come on you. And then he says this in verse 8. He says, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Wow. So when I was a young kid, I remember going down to the banks of the English River south of Kelowna. And I would stand there and I would stand on the bank of the river and I would look at the English River flowing by, knowing that the English flowed to the east, to the Iowa River. From the Iowa River, it flowed to the south and the southeast to the Mississippi River. And from the Mississippi River, it flowed south to the Gulf of Mexico. And the Gulf of Mexico ran in to all that other stuff that's out there. And I thought to myself, huh, the ends of the earth? You know, this is really the beginning. Or maybe the end, depending on your perspective. So that, well, it's not so bad. God's called me to be right here. And then I read about Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And I said, well, Jerusalem's somewhere way over there. And I think Judea is way over there. And Samaria's way over there. And God's called me to be way over here. And, 
and you know, south of Kelowna, south side of the tracks, down along the English River. I mean, we were down in no man's land. It can't be that bad. And as I grew older, I began to understand what he meant when he said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem symbolizes right where I live. You see, the adventure with Jesus begins right here. It begins right here. And if I don't work at that relationship with him in a one-on-one -on -one basis and with those around us, I can never experience what God has called me to be. And God calls us to share that message of hope and salvation with those around us. God calls us to share Christ with those that we come in contact with. In John chapter 10, or Luke chapter 10, the Lord appointed 72 people to go out and share the message of hope and salvation. And they went out and they shared. And Jesus said, now when you go out and share, I want you to recognize if people accept the message, you pray your blessing, pray my blessing on them. If they don't accept the message, take your shoes off, shake the dust out, and it's going to rest on them. They went out. They shared this message of hope and salvation. Some people received them. Some didn't receive them. Then they came back. Oh, it came back. So it, they came back and they met Jesus and they said this. They said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. And then he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this... For this is what you were pleased to do. And, and Jesus describes here that we are called to do greater things than we can ever dream or imagine. And it happens as we submit to him. But he says the greatest thing that happens is not just our sharing, but it's the fact that we have been to the manger. And we have been to the cross and we have been to the tomb, and he looks down at us and says, you're my sons and daughters. And he says, the greatest thing of all is that your name is written in heaven. So Megan stood up here this morning, and she was saying to all of us, I today, in North Clinton Church, am telling the whole world that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I want you to hold me accountable, and I'm willing to hold you accountable. That's a pretty powerful statement. You see, that's starting in our Jerusalem. And as we start in our Jerusalem, we begin to go to our Judea and to our Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that means that we share not only in our town, but we go to our, to our county, to our state, to our nation, to the world that we live in. But it starts right here. And I can tell you, it's really easy to go over there somewhere. Sometimes. Sometimes it's pretty tough. Sometimes it feels like life and death. And, and I can tell you some stories about that whole side that's another, another part for a couple of weeks from now. We'll get there. But, but I can tell you that it starts right here and it's difficult sometimes to share with my family, with my coworkers, and with my friends. It's sometimes easier to go to Africa or China than what it is to go to my next door neighbor. You know what Jesus said to us? It starts in your Jerusalem. If you want to join in the adventure with Jesus, it starts right where you're at. That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. He's commissioned us to start here and go everywhere. In John 15, Jesus says it like this. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And then he says this. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Today, we're on an adventure with Jesus. And that adventure takes us to all kinds of places. They're really unexpected places, but at the same time, you might say the unexpected is really expected. Because if it was only going the way we thought it would, it wouldn't go very far, it wouldn't go very fast. But the unexpected places is being faithful to go wherever God calls us to go. If we don't know Jesus today, you're not on an adventure with Jesus. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, quite frankly, I feel sorry for you because your life's not really good and your Christmas is not much of an advent. It's really death and dying for you. But with Jesus Christ in your heart and with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's an adventure. It's cool. It's great. We can be like the 72 saying, Jesus, you ought to see it. I was out there and I was sharing and even the spirits were bowing down in your name. And he's going, yeah, I know. That's just how it works. You see, that's the adventure with Jesus. It blows us away. And it's supposed to because it's not about me. It's not about us. It's about him. And as we share that message of hope, it's then that we hear the bells of Christmas singing. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your great love for us, your great provisions for us. And I pray, God, that as we live our life, that we might faithfully share true life to those around us, that we can truly live the adventure you have called us to live on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand. He is risen. He is risen. That's why we have Advent. That's why we have Christmas is because he is alive and well. As we go to prayer, I invite you to join me. God, I thank you so much for your great love and care for us. I thank you for what you have called us to as a people. Now to you who, is, who are able to keep us from falling and to present you before your glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to you be power and majesty and glory forever. Amen.